with the might of an average knight, but even the formidable strength of the mightiest ordinary knight or a paladin. The old man's explanation bore an earnestness that resonated deeply within Ao. P. Paladin? Ao uttered, her confusion evident. The term held an aura of power, yet she possessed scant knowledge about these enigmatic individuals. He he, the elderly man turned his attention back to the sales counter, casually sipping his coffee without a hint of haste. Only then did he begin to speak, his gentle voice infused with a newfound enthusiasm. Paladins, they stand a tier above ordinary knights. Among the ranks of knights, you have the low-tier, mid-tier, and high-tier knights. But paladins surpass even the highest echelon of ordinary knights. They roam the kingdom freely and unrestrained, commanding respect and power. Whether they are not the heroic slayers of monsters and demons or esteemed leaders within vast armies, paladins are still the true pillars of knightly orders. I realized that within the world of knights, there existed a hierarchy with even greater strength than the common knights. The revelation left her feeling as if she had just embarked on the first step of her knightly journey. As the elderly man grew more animated, he suddenly thrust his walking stick into the ground, his previously squinted eyes widening in fervor. With a distant, reverential gaze, he spoke as though I were not present. And above the paladins, there exist the holy knights. Holy knights. Our's entire being quivered at the utterance of those two words. Yes, the old man's eyes glistened with emotional tears, his aged hands trembling incessantly. He continued his excited discourse. The holy knights, even in my many years at this training school, I have only caught glimpses of them a handful of times. They possess the ability to move unhindered within the empire of Celestia. A single holy knight can decimate an entire army and lay siege to a formidable town. Each one of them stands on equal footing with the esteemed knightly orders of an entire region. Holy Knights. Our's mind conjured vivid images of heroic figures, mighty individuals who obliterated hordes of demons with their holy swords, materializing before her eyes, as if plucked from the pages of cherished storybooks. Her slender hands clenched around the umbrella she unknowingly stole, as though it were a gleaming katana. The resolute grip emitted a distinct sound, indicative of the strength pulsating within her. For those who treaded this path, those who had tasted the ecstasy of wielding a sword, who among them wouldn't aspire to ascend to the zenith of power, who wouldn't yearn to merge with the wind, striding side by side with these powerful holy knights. In the society where I resided, being a demi-human and a young girl rendered her the epitome of vulnerability and frailty according to society's standards. However, within her ignited the unwavering desire to grow stronger. But there was more to her aspirations, she bore the weight of an ultimate dream, to become the strongest. I yearn to be a holy knight, she declared with fervor. I wish to stand by Amora's and Grandpa Aram's side. Aura's excitement surged through her, causing her ears to twitch involuntarily. To the uninitiated, it might seem as if she longed for true romance, but her true yearning lay in attaining the euphoria of ascending to the zenith of power. Young lady, young lady? The shopkeeper's voice interrupted her thoughts. My apologies. Our's face still bore traces of excitement. Her gaze then fell upon the Kartana collection, and she uttered, I, I desire to acquire a standard grade Kartana most suitable to me. Ao had made her decision. To traverse this path, she required a worthy blade, a companion capable of safeguarding her against peril. Her eyes fixated upon the Katanas adorning the wall, their allure beckoning her to wield them. Not only were these swords masterfully crafted, but Ao could also sense a potent aura emanating from them, attuned to her heightened perception. Yet, deep within, Ao sensed they lacked something vital. Observing Ao's hesitance, the elderly shopkeeper nodded amiably. Though this is your first venture into purchasing a sword, young lady, there seems to be an indescribable affinity between you and these weapons. Before proceeding, may I inquire about the desired length of the katana? One meter, Ao responded unconsciously, still somewhat dazed. Please wait here momentarily. The old man retreated into the depths of the store, returning shortly thereafter. In his hands, he presented a long katana with a black hilt and a dark blue scabbard. The sword's handle was encased in a black silk cloth that emitted a subtle azure glow in the dim light. The scabbard, made from the rare hearse's milkwood, boasted intricate designs in golden and bluish hues an impeccable match for Ao's visage blending shades of blue, white, and gold flawlessly. A mere glance at the sword clasped by the old man, and Ao found herself utterly captivated by its exquisite craftsmanship. The design exuded style, 
yet beneath its aesthetics, it carried a delicate intent that resonated with her own. This, without a doubt, was the very sword Ao had been seeking. The elderly gentleman graciously presented the sword to Ao, his eyes filled with anticipation. Young lady, I wish you to draw this magnificent blade and witness its splendor. Draw the sword. Ao's mind jolted as a forgotten truth surged forth. Throughout her training, she had solely relied upon a wooden practice sword, never having had the chance to wield a real blade before. With bated breath, she accepted the sword into her grasp. This burden weighs more upon me than anticipated. Ao's arms quivered under the strain of the blade, which far surpassed the heft of any wooden replica she had ever held. Indeed, it dwarfed the crude pieces of scrap metal the nefarious bandits brandished with malicious intent. Behold, this is an authentic katana that even surpassed quality standards. The elderly man unveiled its origins, his voice tinged with reverence. Forged by the apprentice of the illustrious Broca lineage, the renowned masters of swordcraft residing within the bustling metropolis of Holo. Allow me to present to you the snowflake of Golden Springs, a blade measuring 0.9 meters in length, its weight a staggering 20 kilograms. This marvel has been meticulously fashioned from a standard grade alloy, its blade reinforced with uncommon grade black type carbon. Given your status as a newly enrolled student, we offer this masterpiece at a discounted price of merely 100 gold coins. Truly, it stands as a rare gem among standard grade swords, boasting exquisite color combinations. Rumor has it that the esteemed disciple of Broca has decided to forsake the creation of standard grade swords, dedicating himself to crafting higher grades. This, my dear, is his crowning achievement within the standard grade ranks. The old man's voice resonated with enthusiasm as he beckoned Ao towards other gleaming blades on display. Ao tightly grasped the hilt, a surge of energy coursing through her palms, as if the spirit of the sword flowed into her very being. Before her eyes, the image materialized an austere and perspiring blacksmith, swinging his hammer with determination amid the scorching furnace's inferno. Overwhelmed, Ao instinctively retreated two steps, a mixture of awe and trepidation gripping her heart. Shuing. In a dazzling display, a flash of bluish light streaked forth, propelled by an unseen force, and vanished into the shadows with unfathomable swiftness. My goodness! The elderly man stumbled backward in sheer terror, his legs nearly giving way beneath him. Providentially, the sails counter stood as a steadfast barrier, preventing him from toppling over. Beads of perspiration streamed down the old man's forehead, his heart pounding in his chest. This young woman, appearing so delicate, fragile, and lovely, had astounded him with her ability to swiftly unsheath a lengthy and weighty katana using her slender hands. The katana possessed a captivating allure, the back of the blade adorned with an exquisite design. The cutting edge sharply defined while the opposite side remained shrouded in a delicate haze. Hours reflection danced upon the gleaming blade, as it arched gracefully like the wings of a resplendent hummingbird, a sight both mesmerizing and enchanting. Despite the relatively dim lighting within the room, the blade emitted a subtle radiance, casting an ethereal glow of light blue. Sir, I shall purchase this sword, Ao declared, her fingers tightly clutching the snowflake of golden springs. From the moment she grasped its hilt, she felt an indescribable attachment, unwilling to part with it henceforth. Initially priced at a minimum of 200 gold coins, Ao, having enrolled in some capacity, now had the privilege of procuring standard grade swords at half the cost. Thus, the price of the katana would be reduced to a mere 100 gold coins, as the seller had informed her. It was an amount within hours means, though it would deplete almost her entire savings. Naturally, fairness dictated that one must exercise restraint when acquiring weaponry. It was impracticable to exploit the discount and purchase the entire stock, intending to sell them later for quick riches so purchases are always reviewed. With a resolute expression, Ao withdrew a considerable sum. 60% of the total funds she had received from Sophia, causing her purse to grow noticeably lighter. Yet, her hand remained steady, her countenance filled with a profound satisfaction. Indeed, Ao deemed the acquisition of protective armor unnecessary. Her sole possession now consisted of this very sword, thus justifying her decision to invest her huge sum of money in this single purchase. Take care, young lady. The old man bid farewell his hand waving from beside the creaking wooden door. Ao's heart brimmed with contentment as she cradled her newfound treasure, the katana christened the snowflake of golden springs, and stepped out into the open air. However, unbeknownst to her, 
an individual stood on the terrace, eyes fixed upon her, observing intently. 4. V2 Chapter 45 Our Secret Savior Weeks before Ao left the bordered village, as the first rays of dawn gently caressed the world, Ao stirred from her slumber, her vibrant golden orbs slowly blinking open, greeting the day with a shimmering glow. With grace befitting a captivating being, she delicately emerged from beneath the covers, her petite frame awakening to the world around her. A cascade of waist-length hair as white as freshly fallen snow cascaded down her back, and with a touch as light as a whisper, she brushed aside her strands, revealing her meekly face adorned with an air of innocence. Atop her silky locks, her pointed ears, adorned with black tips, peeked through, marking her as non-human. As she prepared herself for the events that lay ahead, Aoi's attention was drawn to a few strands of golden hair that interwoven with her snowy tresses, infusing her ethereal appearance with a touch of warmth. Her reflection in the mirror, strangely familiar, revealed the image of the one and only white fox girl, whose beauty rivaled the purity of her heart. Completing her enchanting visage was a bushy white tail, swaying with an innate grace, a tangible expression of her inner elegance. Despite the anticipation bubbling within her, a mix of excitement and nervousness twisted her stomach, stealing away her appetite. Ao paused, taking a fleeting moment to collect herself, her delicate fingers lingering on the doorknob before finally turning it. To her surprise, Amora awaited her at the corridor, a silent smile dancing upon her lips as she extended a small vial toward Ao. No words were spoken, but the expression on Amora's face spoke volumes. Amora, the compassionate soul who had taken Ao in during her most vulnerable moments, possessed a beauty that rivaled the radiance of the sun. Her lustrous golden locks cascaded down to her chest when untethered, framing a countenance that exuded both strength and tenderness. Her bluish eyes held a mesmerizing depth of ocean, unafraid to meet the gaze of any soul, causing hearts to race and thoughts to falter in their presence. Every aspect of her was as stunning as the next. Within the vial that Amora presented to Ao shimmered a clear, sparkling liquid. Even with just a single glance, Ao understood the immense value this item held, recognizing its potential significance. Amora, is this for me? Ao's voice carried a mixture of curiosity and gratitude, her gaze fixed upon the vial cradled in her palm. Indeed, my dear, Amora replied, her tone imbued with a protective concern that betrayed her worry. This healing potion is meant to safeguard your well-being. Should the need arise, if you find yourself injured and in peril, consume this potion without hesitation and swiftly seek refuge in a place of safety. I cannot stress enough how vital it is for you to understand this, my dear. The gravity of Amora's words resonated within Aura's heart, her eyes meeting Amora's worrying gaze with a solemn nod of acknowledgement. The vial glistened, its contents a potent concoction known only to those skilled in the art of alchemy or the rare breed of apothecaries. A mere pharmacist could never craft such a miraculous potion. Amora, with her extensive knowledge of medicinal arts, had acquired this precious healing potion from a wandering merchant who had graced their village. The rarity of its materials and the exorbitant cost were evident in the price she must have paid. Ah, healing potions, my dear, Amora spoke with a gentle tone, her voice laden with wisdom. Though they possess remarkable mending properties, one must not be tempted into recklessness. They have their limitations, unable to mend severe injuries or restore lost limbs. It is wiser to avoid harm altogether, my dear. Do you comprehend the weight of my words? Ao nodded earnestly, her hand clasping Amora's as she accepted the vial. The touch of Amora's calloused hand spoke volumes of her commitment to safeguarding the village, managing the inn, and tending to the garden. Yet, despite her responsibilities, she had found time to care for Ao. With a determined resolve, Ao silently vowed, I shall repay her boundless kindness by returning with the grandest monster core. Ao, that glimmer in your eyes reveals the stirrings of wild ideas, Amora mused. But let me offer a gentle reminder, even the smallest of monsters possess their own unique core. Why not bring back the tiniest one you can find, my dear? True, the likelihood of encountering monsters near the village was scarce. The high mountain range of Maryland and the primordial woods nestled within, guarded by the Gaia Empire's revered monks, acted as a natural deterrent to such creatures. The valiant adventurers of Holo diligently purged the regions near towns and villages of these threats, leaving only the depths of the forest for true monster hunters. Ao would begin her search by exploring the surrounding woods and the base of the small mountain. Though she encountered an abundance of insects, the occasional rabbit, 
and the hiss of a snake, no true monsters graced her path. Lost in her thoughts, Ao contemplated her ideal target a giant mantis ant. Small and feeble, it would be a suitable target. Could she discover one, perhaps foraging for high-quality fruits in an untouched corner of the forest? Surely there existed an uncharted territory in the southwestern part of the woods, a place unknown to most due to the mysterious disappearances of past adventurers. The guild had wisely declared it off-limits, shrouding it in dense foliage and whispers of treacherous pathways. The unknown lands, five kilometers away, lay the possibility of an uncharted fruit, or perchance, the encounter with a rare and formidable monster. Awa's voice resounded with unbridled excitement as she raised her clenched fist, her eyes shimmering with anticipation. Surprisingly, a serene calmness washed over Ao as she ventured deeper into the eastern forest, confident in her innate instincts that would never betray her, regardless of the path she chose. She had honed her skills diligently, dedicating countless hours to the art of swordplay. Amora, her trusted companion, had even praised her remarkable progress over the past year. Ao convinced herself that facing a single monster should pose no insurmountable challenge now. I must hold steadfast to my confidence. I am capable of this task. I shall prevail. With unyielding determination, Ao vigilantly surveyed her surroundings, repeating those self-assuring words silently in her mind. After traversing for what felt like an hour, Ao's senses alerted her to an unsettling realization. The forest had fallen eerily silent, engulfed in an unnatural stillness and an air of desolation. When had she last laid eyes upon a living creature? When had she last heard the harmonious symphony of nature? The lingering sense of danger pervaded every inch of her being, as though the very wind had halted its whispering presence within this lifeless area. A chilling shiver coursed through her, akin to an icy gust in the midst of winter. Something is amiss, Ao muttered, her instincts urging her to retreat. But then, a faint whimper reached her ears. Although fully aware of the need to depart promptly, a primal compulsion pushed Ao closer toward the origin of that pitiful cry a blooded fledgling nestled at the base of a towering tree. Barely a few days old, the tiny creature, its ebony feathers ruffled and stained with crimson, lay upon the earth, gasping for breath with closed, pained eyes. It appeared destined to succumb within mere hours. Yet, inexplicably, the prior sense of impending peril vanished into thin air as soon as Aua's gaze locked onto the fragile avian form. Oddity. How does this minuscule life survive alone? The surroundings grew dimmer and more somber, an aura of foreboding encircling Ao. The wounded chick gradually fluttered its eyes open, revealing orbs of dark blue that mirrored the boundless expanse of the dark sky, silently beseeching her for aid. Driven by an instinctual impulse, Aua's hands moved instinctively. Without a second thought, she administered the healing potion bestowed upon her by Amora, delicately nurturing the ailing creature. Her gentle touch traversed its fragile form as she whispered soothing words, assuring the chick of its imminent recovery. Yet, just as I believed the creature had stabilized, a piercing screech pierced the air. Undoubtedly, it writhed in agony a consequence of the restorative potion's hastened mending properties, inflicting a torturous pain upon its recipient. Ao began to utter the word you will be, before her voice trailed off, stunned by the astonishing sight unfolding before her eyes. The chick, previously small and delicate, grew rapidly, expanding in size until it towered over her. It emitted a thunderous bellow, reverberating through the air. In an effortless motion, the monstrous creature sank its teeth into her vulnerable form, tearing on her shoulder with merciless, carnage-like force. Ao felt her consciousness waning, her mind consumed by a sense of foolishness and numbness. In this world, birds with black feathers were unheard of. The solitary winged creature known for its obsidian feathers was the fearsome black dragon, whispered to possess strength surpassing that of a hundred knights. The creature must have assumed the guise of an innocent fledgling to deceive her, and Ao, unwittingly, had fallen into its trap. She had healed it, and now, the world around her dimmed, fading into a haze as Ao sensed her lifeblood pouring forth. The black dragon, revealing its true nature, widened its jaws and greedily devoured her lower half. This is the end, Ao thought, her mind wandering to a time when she was captured by knights in her distant homeland. Her rigorous training seemed futile now, as if she were nothing more than a helpless frog trapped within the confines of a well, oblivious to the vastness beyond its stone walls. They say one's life flashes before their eyes in the face of death. Amora forgive me, Ao muttered, her voice strained. The black dragon sunk its teeth deeper into her side, 
causing a searing pain that blurred her vision with crimson hues. And yet, in that moment of excruciating agony, something peculiar happened. Aura's body instinctively shut down her senses, shielding her from the overwhelming torment that exceeded all boundaries of pain tolerance. Memories of Ao in an unfamiliar realm surged forth, recollections of encounters with two deities that surpassed even the most extravagant folklore. This is madness. I will encounter them once more. It cannot be real. Ao choked on her own blood, her voice a mixture of anguish and desperation. Someone from the heavens, died me, once again. As her life force ebbed away, the dragon's fangs piercing her side, Ao's soul detached from her mortal vessel, to a place beyond. Agonizing pangs lacerated her with every breath, assaulting her throat, lungs, and vital organs, reducing them to searing embers. Hours fragile frame convulsed, a testament to the excruciating torment coursing through her veins. Yearning for respite, Ao fervently wished for the pain to cease. Miraculously, as if in response to her desperate plea, the torment gradually receded, allowing her to draw in air more freely. Slowly, consciousness seeped back into Ao's being. The touch of a frigid breeze caressed her pallid cheek, while the sun's warm rays bathed her in their gentle embrace. The scent of the surrounding forest wafted through the air, infiltrating her nostrils. Time felt like an eternity when she lost in a void, yet I retained no memory of her presence in that place. Bewilderment enveloped her as she questioned her everything went after. Summoning her strength, I gingerly propped herself up, only to be confronted by a daunting sight an ebony dragon, splattered in crimson its terrifying lifeless eyes fixed upon her. Hours gaze traveled beyond the decapitated head, revealing her grim surroundings a nightmarish pool of blood, viscera, and bubbling flesh. The nauseating stench invaded her senses, inducing waves of queasiness. Amidst this grotesque scene, she discerned the silhouette of a male figure, his robust upper body sculpted with sheer power. Obscured by shadows, the man's visage remained concealed, leaving only his imposing form draped in resplendent armor, which radiated faint hints of golden luminosity. Our senses once again faltered, overwhelmed by dizziness that threatened to wrest control of her mind and body. Who are you? Ao managed to rasp, her trembling hand outstretched. Her vision blurred, yet she could discern that he cradled her delicate form within his arms. Despite the haze clouding her senses, a comforting aura exuded from him, soothing her restless spirit and coaxing her weary eyes to flutter shut. No answer escaped his lips. An inexplicable warmth, akin to a tranquil stream, cascaded into her fragile vessel, infusing her with a serene sensation devoid of discomfort. Exhaustion inundated her being, eclipsing her consciousness. A faint echo of the figure's voice reached her ears, but the words eluded her grasp as she succumbed to the blissful embrace of slumber. 3. V2 Chapter 46 Hours Childish Nature Part 1 In the realm shrouded in perpetual darkness, where the weight of memories lingered like a haunting melody, there stood Ao, adrift in the ethereal haze of her mind. Her once vibrant eyes, once brimming with vitality, now dulled under the burden of an unspoken memory, a memory steeped in pain. As the whispers of time gently tickled her ears within this timeless abyss, a memory materialized before her like a distant foliage. Frozen in the recesses of her mind, it played out like a delicate reel of film. It was a moment saturated with trauma, a tempest of despair engulfing her as a jet-black monstrosity devoured her very essence. Yet, from the chaos emerged a figure, a guardian angel draped in unwavering bravery. In this vivid recollection, she witnessed herself teetering on the precipice of oblivion, her very being on the verge of annihilation, her flesh rending apart. Agony resonated through her heart and tears threatened to spill from her delicate eyes, a testament to her anguish. However, just as her last breath escaped her, she found herself transported to an infinite, familiar sanctuary, where a hand extended from a mirror behind her, a hand resolute and unwavering, pulling her away from the brink. Her savior, a beacon of light amidst the all-encompassing darkness, had descended into her life like a divine intervention. His touch, both gentle and unyielding, reverberated through the depths of her soul. At that moment, she discovered solace within the strength of his presence, a temporary respite from the relentless storm that raged within her. But alas, the tendrils of the past were insidious, and even the sweetest and darkest memories offered only fleeting sanctuary. As her mind weaved through the intricate tapestry of recollection, a touch grazed her shoulder, jolting her back to the reality that enveloped her. Startled, 
She turned to confront the intruder, her gaze colliding with a pair of piercing eyes that reflected the pain she bore. It was a convergence of worlds, a collision between the past and the present, a single moment of recognition. The melodrama of her thoughts shattered against the rawness of the present, leaving her once again standing on the path, clutching her newly acquired sword, snowflake of golden springs. You stand in my path, young miss, a knight clad in resplendent silver armor addressed her with an authoritative tone, causing Ao to instinctively sidestep. I beg your pardon, sir, Ao replied, offering a slight bow. The knight halted and turned towards her, speaking as he continued walking. I must caution you, young demi-human, though you may be a recent addition to our esteemed Dragon's Nest institution. It would be wise for you to exercise caution in your encounters with the church, regardless of your intended destination. Ah watched his retreating figure, her attention fixated on the broadsword that dwarfed her waist. Thoughts of his power and advice consumed her, temporarily erasing the premonition that had haunted her moments earlier. Deciding to set aside her contemplations and ease her mind, Ao departed from the training grounds and made her way back to the Scarlet Ember Inn, seeking respite from the rain that poured relentlessly outside. Before surrendering herself to drowsiness, Ao murmured softly, her gaze drifting towards a nearby cabinet. The golden fruit I beheld upon awakening, and the armored figure who rescued me from the clutches of a dragon. These memories seem too unreal. The next morning, Ao leisurely strolled through the town her eyes captivated by the influx of outsiders. Narahide, a mid-tier town, adorned itself with a splendid palette of purple, white, and brown. With a single glance around, a mesmerizing panorama of marble stones and amethystine arbor trees greeted her gaze. Unlike in the past, a new trend towards public gardens had emerged. The town had meticulously scattered its prided trees throughout, each amethystine arbor standing as a testament to its sacredness. Renowned for their breathtaking purplish-pink flowers that bloomed during summer, these trees held far more significance than mere aesthetics. Yet, the true allure of the amethystine arbor lay not in its delicate blossoms. Every decade, a mystical phenomenon occurred, as faint traces of white light imbued the leaves and flowers. These radiant blooms possessed the power to heal humans and bring harm to monsters. Legend whispered that an ancient hero, representing the Celestial Empire, had once ventured to this very place, employing the tree's magical properties to defy heal wounds and curses. According to legends, the descendants of those heroes are now esteemed kings and esteemed nobles of the Celestia kingdoms, I reminisced, her mind wandering to the tales she had heard from Amora, the ardent seeker of ancient lore. Standing amidst the myriad of trees, I marveled at the transformation Narahide had undergone compared to what she heard. Once adorned with verdant greenery in parks and along its streets, the landscape now radiated an abundance of bluish-purple hues. Steering away from the bustling main street, Ao indulged in the pleasure of sightseeing. In the affluent residential district, where opulence thrived, clusters of children frolicked joyfully. Bold boys fearlessly scaled the amethystine arbor trees adorning their homes, leaping down as a test of their mettle. Meanwhile, girls, their arms embracing dolls, formed endearing cliques, engaged in innocent play. Before long, the boys found themselves gathered on benches, their laughter ringing through the air, while the girls merrily chased each other in harmonious camaraderie. Under the soothing shade, housewives exchanged hushed gossip, while diligent men diligently carried out their duties in bustling commercial establishments, catering to the needs of knights and adventurers. The passers-by, their lives intersecting momentarily with ours, captivated her curiosity. She couldn't help but be enthralled by the palpable authenticity that contrasted starkly with the destitution she had witnessed in the slums of Honeywood. Can you believe it? These children casually toss aside copper and bronze coins, and shower the fountains with silver as if it were nothing but trifles. Such wastefulness. I couldn't help but feel drained of her own vitality as she pondered the stark disparity of wealth gap again. Clad in her trusty hoodie, she stealthily maneuvered through the bustling streets her concealed presence going unnoticed amidst a sea of sword wielders and masked individuals. A valuable weapon at standard level known as the Snowflake of Golden Springs remained securely fastened to her waist, a constant reminder of being cautious to her surroundings. Unbeknownst to her, the meandering path she had taken led her to a lively shopping district. Though towering trees still held dominion over the surroundings, the vibrant hues of the townsfolk's attire and the kaleidoscope of colors adorning the shop's interiors added a vibrant touch to the serene atmosphere. 
Children darted playfully between the adults, infusing the scene with youthful energy. Ao couldn't help but observe the numerous women carrying baskets, while men, knights, and adventurers seemed to be a scarce sight. Unlike the grand establishments that catered to travelers and knights along the main boulevard, this particular shopping district catered predominantly to the locals. It boasted an assortment of wares specifically designed for household use. Ao wandered through the district, stealing glances at butchers' shops and greengrocers, until the irresistible aromas tantalized her senses. Succumbing to temptation, she indulged herself in the freshly picked fruits until her ravenous cravings were appeased. As she relished in her fruity feast, the surrounding onlookers cast puzzled gazes upon Ao. However, she paid them no mind, for these fruits were her sustenance, her very essence. After aimlessly strolling for a while, Ao found herself standing before an open-fronted store. Its wide entrance beckoned her with an air of intrigue, while a bustling crowd of young teenagers bustled in and out. What could this place be? Ao pondered in a hushed voice, her eyes fixated on the expansive, warehouse-like structure before her. Glimpsing a counter within, Ao witnessed a woman donned in an apron accepting payment from a boy towering over Ao's own height. In return, the woman handed him a peculiar, angular object roughly the size of his torso. The walls of the store were adorned with countless display cases, showcasing an assortment of merchandise. Taking a few steps back, Ao surveyed the entirety of the shopping district once more, only to realize that this particular establishment stood as the solitary haven for a vast number of young individuals. Intrigued by this unique scenario, Ao hesitantly stepped inside. The interior was awash in pristine white, creating an ambience of brightness and cleanliness. Numerous tables and chairs were arranged meticulously, occupied by groups of young teens and children engaging in a ritualistic interaction of sorts. Surrounding each table, a cluster of spectators observed intently, their whispers occasionally punctuating the air. Amidst her observations, Auer's gaze fell upon a lone adult woman sitting at one of the tables. A mother, perhaps. However, Ao paid her scant attention. The fervor and enthusiasm radiating from the participants enveloped her, arousing her dormant curiosity. Emboldened by the collective energy, she finally mustered the courage to approach one of the occupied tables. The atmosphere buzzed with excitement, the air crackling with anticipation. The throng of people stood firm, refusing to yield and grant Ao entry into the circle. Undeterred, she lingered on the outskirts, craning her neck in a futile attempt to catch a glimpse of what lay within. Eventually, she conceded that there were other tables, albeit slightly less crowded. With a spark of curiosity, she turned her gaze towards another table. Could it be? Two boys sat across from each other, their eyes locked in concentration. One of them manipulated an object on a board adorned with alternating black and white squares. Various intricately designed figures, distinguished by their numbers, colors of black or brown, and adorned with letters, dotted the surface. Some pieces lay scattered outside the boundaries of the board. Hours voice barely above a whisper, she breathed, its chess. Memories of her time in the bordered village flooded back, when Amora had taught her the game. They had both become enthralled by its complexities. Chess, like love my for you, has the power to make you happy, right? I remember those days, I amused, when I finally bested her. I couldn't contain my joy. The sight of the chessboard after such a long time awakened a wave of nostalgia within her. So captivated was she by the game that Ao failed to notice the boy sitting just near her, who had paused in his play, bewitched by the appearance of the enchanting girl beneath the hood. There are so many vulnerabilities on the black side, yet white fails to seize the opportunity. Ao's eyebrows shot up in seriousness. Her gaze remained fixated on the boy's gameplay. The other boy sat in a silent state of confusion until, after stealing glances at Ao and then back to the table, he suddenly remembered he was engaged in a match and refocused on the chess game. Oblivious to the commotion she caused, Ao continued her scrutiny. Ao ventured to inspect the other chess games and found several displays of remarkable skill. Ah, this is an excellent move for White. The opponent's king is perilously close to checkmate, she murmured in awe. Curiosity ignited within her and she wandered from table to table, unaware that she was now the center of attention. She observed players expertly checkmating their opponents. So, this is a chess tournament, she deduced. Raising her head, Ao surveyed her surroundings. Finally, a clear image of the scene before her formed. Behind a cluster of anxious teenagers and children, who nervously looked away whenever her gaze swept over them, 
Stid a display showcasing exquisite chessboards crafted from high-quality wood. The intricate wooden figurines of kings, queens, and other pieces were carefully arranged and preserved. Adjacent to the display, a counter offered chessboards and meticulously carved wooden figurines for sale. Of course, this enigmatic building was no ordinary shop. It was a haven where chess enthusiasts congregated. Her heart raced with exhilaration as hours anticipation reached its peak. Suppressing the urge to burst out with unrestrained excitement, she pleaded fervently, struggling to contain her emotions, may I have the honor of joining. However, Ao knows it was disrespectful. Brimming with delight at the prospect of stepping back into the past, she eagerly scanned her surroundings, her senses heightened. Suddenly, a booming voice echoed from a nearby platform, drawing her attention along with the rest of the crowd. The victor of this grand tournament announced the event's host, employing a mystical seashell to amplify his voice, captivating the attention of both onlookers and chess players alike. Aura's countenance turned slightly melancholic, a trace of sadness creeping onto her face, as the realization struck her that the tournament had already reached its conclusion. Her lips formed a subtle pout, a gentle hint of disappointment apparent in her expression. Navigating her way through the gathered throng of spectators, Aura's eyes alighted upon a figure that held her captive. Curiosity sparkled in her young, innocent eyes as she observed the person before her. He's so beautiful, she whispered in awe, her voice filled with pure wonder and innocence. One next chapter is scheduled to be published five hours from now. Sorry for the late updates. 3. V2 Chapter 47, Hours Childish Nature Part 2. One finally hit 100k words mark. The victor of this grand tournament announced the event's host, employing a mystical seashell to amplify his voice, captivating the attention of both onlookers and chess players alike. Aura's countenance turned slightly melancholic, a trace of sadness creeping onto her face, as the realization struck her that the tournament had already reached its conclusion. Her lips formed a subtle pout, a gentle hint of disappointment apparent in her expression. Navigating her way through the gathered throng of spectators, Aura's eyes alighted upon a figure that held her captive. Curiosity sparkled in her young, innocent eyes as she observed the person before her. He's so beautiful, she whispered in awe, her voice filled with pure wonder. Standing regally at the center of the stage, he emanated an aura befitting a noble young master. Every aspect of his attire had been meticulously tailored to his every whim, radiating elegance and refinement in every stitch. This young man possessed a visage that could bewitch hearts. Delicate features adorned his face, exuding a masculine charm that was impossible to ignore. His meticulously styled chestnut brown locks cascaded in soft waves, perfectly framing his countenance. Deep sapphire eyes, brimming with intelligence and kindness, sparkled with a touch of resolute determination. His features were well-defined, his straight nose accentuating the balanced structure of his face. A pair of finely groomed eyebrows arched gracefully above his eyes enhancing the overall allure of his countenance. His fair and smooth complexion seemed untouched by the sun's harsh rays, hinting at a life of privilege and leisure. As he stood upon the stage, his expression conveyed a sense of quiet confidence, yet there was a warmth and approachability that invited others to engage with him. His lips, softly curved into a gentle smile, reflected his amiable nature and genuine humility. Adorned in resplendent garments crafted from the finest materials, he stood out among the crowd. His clothing had been meticulously tailored, accentuating his noble bearing. A regal jacket of deep indigo adorned his frame, intricately embroidered with gold thread, symbolizing his victory as the gold medalist. The jacket, embellished with exquisite patterns and designs, served as a testament to his elevated status and impeccable taste. Beneath the jacket, he wore a crisp, pristine white shirt that perfectly complemented his vibrant complexion. A silk cravat, carefully tied, adorned his neck, adding a touch of sophistication to his ensemble. His trousers, fashioned from a luxurious fabric, fit him flawlessly, showcasing his slender yet athletic build. Completing his attire were polished leather shoes, gleaming under the spotlight. Each step he took exuded grace and refinement, further enhancing his overall aura of nobility. With every movement, his clothing exuded a sense of opulence and prestige, serving as a reflection of his privileged upbringing and esteemed position within society. As the young man stood upon the stage, his demeanor radiated a quiet confidence and genuine humility. His gaze scanned the crowd, causing a mob of girls to shriek in delight.
However, his attention came to a sudden halt upon catching sight of an unusual hooded girl, her eyes darting furtively in every direction. His eyes narrowed as he noticed the hidden sword hanging from her waist. A knight, he muttered, his voice laced with intrigue and curiosity. Humans have beautiful faces, aren't they? Ao looks at the beautiful countenance of the people around her much like the young gentleman on the stage. She only recently realized it, which makes her perplexed. She looks around contemplating why. Why did I miss such an obvious notion? Is that because it was normal or I am really that ignorant? Books say humans came from monkeys, now I doubt that theory. It makes sense given monkeys can't conjure magic and, Ao has tapped on dangerous topics without realizing the implications of it. However, what made her snapped back into reality was the very young man himself, wearing the gold medal in his neck, was now in her front, smiling towards her like a creep. The knight behind him was strong to Ao as she could tell it, but this knight was nothing towards the young man who was right in her nose. This very powerful young man caresses Ao's right cheek with his left hand wearing a glove and lifts her chin. Ao trembled and did in, T know what to do as the person himself is too intimidating and powerful to resist. Ah, Ao is trembling all over her body, she can't help it but terrified. Upon seeing her golden eyes that were in the verge of tears, the young man pulled back his hand. I apologize for making you comfortable, miss, after saying that, he smiled towards her. Ao didn't feel anything but emptiness as if she thought she was dead moments ago but did not. However, the girls the same age as him were getting crazy over such a sight. Kaya, one by one they fell to the ground, sly grins on their blush faces could be seen after shrieking in delight upon seeing the heavenly smile of their crush. Heaven, one of the girls on the tiled floor said, still losing her mind. Her parents on the side covered their faces with towels out of sheer embarrassment and carried away their daughter still in daze. W what happened? Oh oh no, Amora, is this what you called a mental attack? Ours got confused and terrified once again. She runs away from the young man because she knows she has no idea how to protect herself from such an unknown invisible attack. The idea of facing the unknown is a terrifying concept after all. The fact that he easily made the girls lose their mind obviously wants to tell her that he can conquer her as well. Amora still has the idea of not making any contact with the opposite sex to her no matter what. Ao believes it's better to run away from such nasty people. Ao knew it was disgraceful behavior for a young girl to run away from a son of a noble family, but she definitely didn't want to be laid down in front of a large crowd of people who would watch and laugh at her. Ao is definitely an introvert, she stretches down her hoodie to cover her face more. However, as she lost control of her fear, she carelessly failed to check her surroundings with her senses. She rounded the corner of the building and ran with full force into the person standing on the other side. Ao and the person she ran into both let out exclamations of surprise, and then she seemed to try to catch her. However, Ao was running at full force, with the centrifugal force she'd gained rounding the corner being included in that. Not being able to withstand the powerful impact, Ao tumbled to the ground and her head hurt a lot from the impact. Ah, oh, a piercing pain shot through her ankle next. But rather than her own pain, Ao was focused on apologizing to the person she had tumbled into. She raised her head and began to utter her apology. Ah, oh, I'm so. Before she could finish, however, a strong force pulled her arms behind her back and pinned her down. Ow, Ao was being held down on the ground from behind by the big, strong metallic hands of a knight. Let her go. Ao heard a familiar voice, and the force that was restraining her relaxed. When Ao raised her head, she saw the woman she'd run into standing in her front. Sorry about that. I meant to stop you, but I made you fall instead. Are you hurt? Our Lady Sophia. She had run into someone with great force which knocked herself down. When Ao realized the person was Lady Sophia L. Mondragon, she forgot all about the pain and quickly kneeled before her right there. The proprietress of the only one female only inn of the narrow hide was a vision of elegance and refinement. Her frilly luxurious crimson dress was a masterpiece of fashion, adorned with intricate lace and delicate embroidery different from the formal attire of the people around. The dress was made from the finest silk fabric of bloodsucker spiderweb, showcasing a soft pastel color that perfectly complemented her fair complexion. Sophia had long, flowing locks of ebony hair that cascaded down her back, meticulously styled to perfection. Her enchanting black grayish eyes sparkled with intelligence and curiosity, revealing a keen intellect behind her graceful demeanor. 
Her features were delicate, with a slender nose, high cheekbones, and a gentle smile that graced her rosy lips. As Ao kneeled before her, Lady Sophia's initial surprise gradually transformed into a look of compassion and understanding. Her voice carried a hint of warmth and maturity as she responded, Please, there's no need for such formality, Miss Ao. It was an accident, and I'm unharmed. I hope you're not injured either. Her voice held a touch of nobility and confidence, reflecting her upbringing and the poise expected of someone of her stature. Despite her standing of being the principal of the training school, Lady Sophia possessed a kind heart and genuine empathy for others, evident in the way she interacted with those around her. Lady Sophia extended a gloved hand towards Ao, a gesture of both assistance and forgiveness. Let me help you up, my little student, she offered, her eyes filled with a sense of graciousness. Accidents happen, after all. We should both be more careful next time. I, I deeply apologize. Tears welled up in her eyes, a sight that pained Sophia to her core. Fate seemed to weave its intricate threads as Ao, in her haste, collided with the principal of a formidable faction school, the esteemed owner of the Scarlet Ember Inn, and unintentionally inflicted harm upon Sophia. Consequently, Sophia's vigilant bodyguard restrained Ao, acting in accordance with the gravity of the situation. Miss Ao, it appears that our paths are destined to cross once again. Despite the circumstances, Sophia appeared unruffled, even hinting at a sense of contentment upon recognizing Ao's identity. Extending her hand towards the young girl still rooted to the ground, Sophia beckoned. To think that a mere collision would result in my injury. Am I truly so feeble? Or perhaps, is Lady Sophia truly that formidable? As Sophia cradled her right wrist, it became evident that Ao had inadvertently harmed her during the impact. A pallor washed over Ao, for she knew that her carelessness had led her to harm not only the principal but also a noble lady. Such an offense, considered less majest, surely spelled severe consequences. Her aide, a male student by her side, hastily took hold of her hand. Madam, are you injured? No, I am not. However, Sophia's gaze shifted towards Ao, who sat upon the ground, her countenance pale yet resolute in suppressing her negative emotions. Please assist her in standing. The knight who had restrained Ao exchanged a wordless glance with the male student standing at Sophia's side. Neither appeared inclined to extend a helping hand. The tears Ao had fought to contain threatened to spill over, prompting her to bite her lip and regain composure. Determined to cease her display of disgrace, Ao resolved to rise unaided. Ah, yet, the twisted ankle throbbed with pain, causing her to lose her balance once more. Miss Ao, it was Sophia who steadied her. Lady Sophia, I beg your forgiveness. Flustered, Ao attempted to distance herself from Sophia's grasp, but the lady held her with a steadfastness akin to a father caring for his daughter. Do not exert yourself further. It appears you have twisted your ankle. Allow me to escort you to the infirmary. With bated breath, Sophia lifted Ao into her arms. Although Ao was petite, her weight must have still burdened Sophia, a fact not lost on those observing their interaction. Lady Sophia, there is no need to trouble yourself for my sake. Ao tried to dissuade her, but Sophia was already making her way towards the nearby clinic, carrying Ao in her embrace like a baby. Milady, permit me, her loyal guard interjected, rushing over. However, Sophia paid him no heed. I believe she would feel uneasy being carried by someone she does not trust. You two may return for today. Sophia's tone conveyed her disappointment in the two men's failure to immediately offer their assistance to Ao earlier. But, her bodyguard remained uncertain, torn between allowing a member of a prestigious family to wander unaccompanied and his inability to assist while Sophia clung to the young girl in the hood. Ignoring the dismayed pair trailing behind her, Sophia pressed on towards the clinic outside the hall. 3. V2 Chapter 48 Ao Receives Soulbound Relic Next Unfazed by the presence of the two young men trailing behind her, their incompetence apparent, Sophia pressed on, determined to reach the infirmary. Onlookers puzzled over the negligence displayed, questioning why a noble lady, and moreover, a respected principal, would be burdened with the task of carrying an injured child while the men stood idle. The townsfolk, well aware of Lady Sophia's benevolence, found solace in witnessing her tender care for the child. The people of Narahai Town held her in high esteem, their admiration palpable. Greetings, Lady Sophia, a sudden voice called out from behind, finally compelling Sophia to halt her steps as she cradled Ao in her arms. Ah, 
so you are the young man I've heard of, the prodigious son of my dear friend and heir to the illustrious Everhart household, Kingston L. Everhart. How fortuitous, Sophia responded. Ow, oh, realizing that the caller was none other than the gentleman who had graced the stage earlier, promptly lowered her head, concealing her face. Kingston, accompanied by a guard, was en route to his residence. Under normal circumstances, Ao would have been obliged to offer a proper greeting, but in her current state of being carried by Sophia, a mere bow of the head was the best she could manage, her terror evident. Congratulations on your victory in the chess tournament once again as champion. However, I request your assistance in employing your healing arts on her. I inadvertently caused her harm, Sophia implored. Ao hastened to refute his words. Lady Sophia, it was I who collided with you. She was the one who had dashed out recklessly, paying no attention to her surroundings, and subsequently collided with and injured herself. Moreover, she couldn't fathom accepting the use of healing arts for such a minor injury. It was an accident, Sophia interjected. Young Miss remains injured. We shall escort her to the infirmary immediately. As for you two, you may depart. I shall accompany Lady Sophia, Kingston declared. Upon hearing Kingston's command, the flustered men trailing behind Sophia bowed their heads and departed. Thus, Sophia, Kingston, and his bodyguard escorted Ao to the clinic, capturing the attention of all who beheld them. Ao longed to retreat to the comfort of her dormitory, but unable to voice her sentiments, she kept her head lowered, striving to avoid the prying gazes of onlookers. The infirmary appeared devoid of occupants. However, Kingston proceeded to unlock the door and ushered the two of them inside, as if it were his personal abode. With utmost care, Sophia gently laid Ao upon a bed. Just as Kingston was about to cast a healing art with his right hand, his brows furrowed, and his mouth hung open in surprise. Your ankle isn't injured. I was certain. Kingston's brows furrowed, a tinge of perplexity coloring his expression, as he cast his gaze downward toward her ankle. No signs of blood or anything as if nothing had happened. Much to Ao's astonishment, there was no trace of injury or the throbbing pain that had haunted her mere moments ago. It was as if the collision with Kingston and the subsequent fall had been naught but a figment of her imagination. Utter confusion swirled within her mind. Amora said the same thing to me. Meanwhile, Sophia, who had been observing the scene unfold, let out a heartfelt sigh of relief. Oh, thank the heavens, Miss Ao. It appears there was a grievous misunderstanding, and your ankle remains unharmed. Ao nodded, her composure still shaken by the sudden twist of fate. I struggle to comprehend. I could have sworn I felt excruciating pain coursing through my ankle. Kingston, regaining his poise, stepped forward and examined Ao's ankle with discerning eyes. It seems that what you experienced was but a transient discomfort, rather than a genuine injury. Perhaps the force of impact momentarily strained your delicate bones and sinews, yet your resilient body swiftly mended itself. Ao mulled over Kingston's words, attempting to make sense of the perplexing turn of events. She had heard whispered tales of gifted healers who possessed extraordinary abilities to restore broken bodies with naught but a gentle touch. However, the notion that such miraculous regenerative ability had manifested here seemed utterly implausible. I offer my sincerest apologies for my misguided reaction, Kingston interjected, breaking the lingering silence. I allowed my alarm to cloud my judgment, presuming the worst when, in truth, no harm had befallen you. Please forgive my hastiness, fair miss. Ao shook her head, a lingering curiosity fueling her inquiry. No apology is necessary, Lord Kingston. It appears my body mended itself spontaneously. A spark of recognition flickered within Sophia's widened eyes, enlightenment illuminating her features. The silver wolves, they possess indomitable vitality, no wonder. However, before her thoughts could fully materialize, Sophia's attention was swiftly diverted by a knight stationed at the clinic's entrance, who shook his head in response to her inquiring gaze. Acknowledging his silent message, Sophia nodded understandingly and returned her focus to Ao, who was now gracefully exploring the clinic's confines without a hint of hindrance. I must take my leave, Sophia declared, her tone tinged with regret. I find myself entwined in matters that demand my immediate attention. With a courteous nod, she bid her farewell and departed, leaving Ao and Kingston to their shared intrigue. In a sudden rush of recollection, Kingston voiced his intentions. It seems fitting for me to take my leave as well. Duty beckons, and I must report to my venerable mother. Farewell, young miss concealed beneath the hood.
Without lingering for a response, Kingston hastened away, leaving Ao alone within the quiet embrace of the clinic's walls. As Ao entered her chambers within the scarlet emboin, a wave of contentment washed over her, laced with the lingering excitement of acquiring a new sword. Nestled in the comfort of her surroundings, she found herself drawn to the gleaming weapon resting in her grasp. With delicate care, her fingertips danced along the blade, tracing its intricate design. The resplendent steel yielded beneath her touch, yielding a resonant melody that echoed through the room, amplifying her fascination. Each stroke of her caress etched ephemeral trails temporarily, reminiscent of fragile snowflakes, like fragments of a fleeting dream. Such exquisite beauty. She whispered in breathless wonder, her voice carrying the weight of admiration and reverence. Yet, her visage of unadulterated joy faded into a sudden melancholy as her gaze drifted towards the full moon adorning the night sky. Murmuring softly, her voice tinged with longing, she addressed the majesty, Amora, what are you undertaking at this very moment? The voids lingering within me feels insurmountable, an ache that grips my heart with an unrelenting grasp. The rain relentlessly poured from the dark skies, drenching the world in a ceaseless deluge for two days. Within the confines of the Scarlet Ember Inn, Ao patiently awaited the announcement of the combat examination. She sought solace in her room's backyard, where she honed her sword skills with determination. Each swing of her blade, guided by her steady hands, marked a step towards mastery. This marked the first time she wielded a real sword, necessitating an adjustment period. Ao understood the significance of patience as she painstakingly revisited the fundamentals of swordplay she learned from Amora during their training hours. The arduousness of her training, the sensation of performing push-ups bare-chested, was known only to her. In this self-imposed hardship, she found solace and liberation, momentarily forgetting the profound loneliness that haunted her heart. Master, Ashura, the azure mantle, lay folded near the window alongside the golden fruit. We've been cooped up here for days. Why not take me out for a leisurely stroll? Ao gently caressed the white steel sheet of her katana and gazed at the azura unfolding herself. Each stroke of Ao's caress etched ephemeral trails reminiscent of fragile snowflakes and then disappeared after a few seconds. Azura, the announcement for the combat examination will be made tomorrow. Once that happens, we may embark on a long journey, she murmured, lost in her thoughts. The following morning greeted the world with samba clouds and intermittent rain. The individuals who passed the qualification test congregated near the gate of the training school, their attention focused on the billboard. Meanwhile, fresh-faced examinees arrived to undertake the test, accompanied by curious onlookers. Draped in her azure mantle, Ao approached the billboard, her newly acquired sword, the snowflake of golden springs, hung at her waist. In a way, she eclipsed the emptiness of the billboard itself but her non-human ears, cascading snow-white hair and the flowing blue cape behind her immediately alerted those present to her identity, the young demi-human knight who had achieved astounding results on the previous day and had been handpicked by the revered dragon's nest. News of her exploits spread like wildfire, dissuading any foolhardy attempts to provoke her. Observing eyes, most filled with disdain and few others with admiration and respect, followed her every move from a safe distance. Soon enough, two knights clad in gleaming silver armor emerged from the dragon's nest, affixing a long list of papers onto the billboard. Come, gather around. The contents of the combat examination have been revealed. The crowd grew restless, their anticipation palpable. Ao, however, had no desire to be jostled amongst the ranks of unwashed bodies, prompting her to instinctively step back to avoid inhaling the offensive body odors. Just then, a female student who had assisted in the examination process emerged, her commanding voice resonating through the air as she read the bulletin aloud and adjusted her glasses. The culminating trial of our esteemed Dragon's Nest Training School's annual night's qualification test shall be monster extermination. It was a revelation that held little surprise for the assembled crowd. They had already anticipated such a formidable trial. After donning a protective face mask, the young female student pressed on, her voice tinged with authority. The foul beasts targeted for eradication are none other than the loathsome and repugnant creatures dwelling deep within the mountains of our humble Narahide town, goblins. Goblins? Gasped the crowd, their agitation palpable. Some even felt a queasy churn in their stomachs at the mere thought of encountering such monsters. How can this be? Why has the final combat examination become so arduous this time? Pondered by one examinee aloud. 
Ai Keen eyes surveying the exaggerated reactions of others. Although she was familiar with the monster, she sought confirmation from a seasoned hunter standing nearby. Pardon me, sir, Ao addressed the hunter politely, a hint of curiosity in her voice. What manner of creature are these goblins? Are they truly formidable? I cannot help but notice the prevailing pessimism among our fellow examinees. The hunter looked at her and her pointy ears, seizing the opportunity to showcase his expertise to the young girl who aced the exams recently, began his detailed exposition. Goblins, individually, may not possess overwhelming strength. They bear a sickly pallor on their flesh, akin to the hue of a serpent or a reptile. Yet, what makes them truly perilous is their propensity to operate in packs, executing silent ambushes with uncanny skill and also their saliva are potent acids. They are masters of concealment, experts at masking their own presence. Make no mistake, they are a formidable and bothersome menace. Their numbers have surged within our territory as of late, and their reproductive habits remain a mystery. What is most abhorrent about these goblins is their predilection for thievery, raiding cargo transports and, worst of all, feasting upon human flesh, though they dare not venture near human or demi-human settlements. Aside from demon-infested areas, most of the pathways leading to other places traverse these treacherous mountains, providing the goblins ample opportunities to hide and ambush. Ao absorbed the hunter's words in solemn silence, fully comprehending the gravity of the situation. She understood that facing even a single goblin would prove more formidable than the monsters she had valiantly vanquished alongside her companion, Amora. Back in their quaint village, the art of exterminating these creatures was no trifling matter. The goblins would not simply remain stationary, waiting for an easy strike like a helpless fowl stripped of its legs. On either side of the battlefield, the grim intention to eradicate the opposing force loomed in the hearts of the combatants. It was a clash of intellect and bravery, a test of metal where victory held no regard for the means employed, no matter how treacherous or unjust. The young female student, her countenance enigmatic, refrained from elaboration and subtly conveyed the notion that one could relinquish the perilous pursuit should fear overtake them. With the collective tumult finally subsiding, she proceeded to make her announcement, her voice resonating with authority. As all are well aware, the majority of these monsters are not native denizens of our world. Their corporeal forms bear little significance compared to the essence concealed within their physical cores, known as psyche. It is this intangible essence that holds the greatest value to us, surpassing the coveted monster cores and body parts brought by adventurers. The combat examination stipulation is as follows. Eliminate ten goblins or a superior entity known as the hobgoblin, seize the psyches concealed within their physical cores, and store them within the soul-bound relic. This precious artifact must be delivered to the Dragon's Nest Training School within a strict time constraint of six months. Should you accomplish these requirements, you shall emerge triumphant from this final trial, and the esteemed institution will bestow upon you the Dragon's Nest Legal Student Certificate on a predetermined date. However, for those who falter and fail to meet the requirements, a resolute determination shall be required, as the combat examination will need to be retaken in the following year upon verification of your certificate of enrollment. Allow me to clarify that possession of said certificate confirms your status as a legitimate student within this venerable training school. Nevertheless, it falls short of granting you the esteemed title of knight, for that honor. You must acquire the revered legal student certificate and fulfill the requisites of graduation. I found herself bewildered by the notion of collecting psyches with the soul-bound relic. These concepts had been completely foreign to her until now, and she struggled to comprehend their significance. Observing the growing concern among her peers, the female student stepped forward, recognizing the need to address their inquiries. If you lack a soul-bound relic, she explained, you can utilize your certificate of enrollment from the practical exam as collateral to rent one from the training school. The daily rental fee is set at two gold coins. A wave of protest erupted at the unreasonable cost of such a seemingly commonplace item. What in the world justifies such an exorbitant rent price? One participant exclaimed. Another chimed in, I participated in the previous year's exam, and back then, we were only charged 20 silver coins. Why has the fee increased tenfold? These relics aren't any better than Phoenix Claws. Someone else interjected with frustration. It's ten times more expensive than acquiring the same item in the nearby trading town of Calcutta. A heavy sigh escaped a discontented voice. This is the way of the world, they lamented. 
Monsters are running rampant, yet instead of supporting aspiring knights like ourselves, the training schools are attempting to profit from us. Amidst the chorus of complaints, the female student remained indifferent, her demeanor unaffected by their grievances. She simply stated, those who wish to rent a soul-bound relic, please follow me. Oh, requiring a relic herself, separated from the disgruntled crowd and trailed after the female student, joined by 10 to 15 other participants. She retrieved two gleaming gold coins from her pocket, firmly resolved to overcome this financial hurdle. After all, they had come this far, giving up now over a mere two gold coins was out of the question. Besides, Ao had no idea what the relic even looked like. As they made their way toward the magic tools warehouse, the female student secured her lustrous black hair with a hairband, lending an air of practicality to her appearance. She addressed the group, her voice carrying a sense of authority. Although the purpose of collecting these psyches is for the examination, she explained, the training school will not simply get them from you. For every five goblin psyches you gather, the training school will compensate you with one gold coin. Furthermore, should you vanquish other formidable creatures and acquire their psyches, the training school will purchase them from you at market value. Oh, now a student bound by contract to the training school, respectfully referred to the female student as senior before posing her query. Senior, she inquired, what exactly are these psyches used for? Indeed, it seemed only natural for Ao to address her fellow student in such a differential manner, recognizing the seniority and experience the other possessed within the school's hierarchy. The female student gazed at Ao, her eyes filled with a blend of friendliness and seduction. Ao couldn't help but shiver at the subtle creepiness that emanated from her. Miss Ao, I must say, I am profoundly impressed by your test results, the girl began, her voice carrying a hint of allure. If you have the time, I would be delighted to have a chat at my residence. While these psyches may seem inconsequential to ordinary civilians and low-ranking knights, they hold significant value within the training school. As for why we acquire these intangible psyches, she continued, her words laced with intrigue. One reason is to motivate everyone to combat the monstrous creatures that threaten the safety of our school and the individuals residing nearby. The other reason lies in the fact that esteemed knights, as well as summoners and sorcerers, are willing to pay a high price for these psyches. They employ them to nurture their summoned familiars, refine their magical tools, delve into supernatural arts, and more. In short, these psyches are invaluable to powerful individuals. As for lower-tier knights like us, we need not delve too deeply into the matter. Since prominent figures are willing to invest their wealth, all we need to do is collect the psyches and sell them to those interested parties. In this way, we can also profit from our hunts, don't you agree? Curiosity sparked within Ao as she inquired, but senior, how much can one truly earn by selling these psyches? A mischievous smile played upon the senior student's lips as she responded, Hem Tilda, for most novice knights, the path to earning wealth is treacherous. If their martial skills are lacking or misfortune befalls them, it is all too common for them to end up as mere fodder for the monsters, or worse, forced into the life of an adventurer. However, for seasoned low-tier and mid-tier knights, with caution and strategic avoidance of dangerous zones or the formation of formidable parties, they can amass a substantial fortune. It is not unheard of for them to earn anywhere from 100 to 200 gold coins within a year, she elaborated, her tone tinged with a sense of awe. Indeed, it may sound like an exorbitant sum, equivalent to the annual income of a small village. However, one must not forget that such wealth comes at the cost of risking their very lives. This, my dear, is what we refer to as seeking riches and honor in the face of imminent danger. Ao nodded absent-mindedly, her heart filled with an overwhelming sense of remorse. It dawned on her that earning money as a knight was no simple task. The mere attainment of knighthood was a point of pride, but the constant threat to their lives loomed ominously. In contrast, she had thoughtlessly squandered what would take an ordinary night six long months to accumulate. Upon their arrival at the Magic Tools Warehouse, the group diligently followed the instructions of the young female student. Registering their names and surrendering their certificates of enrollment as collateral, they now awaited the distribution of the highly anticipated soul-bound relics. With an air of mystery, the female student retrieved a small, dark wooden box from the shelf. Despite its unassuming appearance, the box emitted an extraordinary radiance, catching the attention of all present. The box possessed an enigmatic aura, which belied its seemingly ordinary exterior. 
However, what truly captured their interest lay within as she opened it and showed to them an exquisite pearl, intricately crafted and no larger than a clenched fist. Adorned with delicate etchings and filigree, the surface depicted swirling patterns reminiscent of wisps and a constellation. Emitting a soft, pulsating glow akin to a mesmerizing rainbow, the orb shifted through various hues of blue, white, green, and purple. It seemed to encapsulate a fragment of the night sky itself. Casting the wooden box into the air, the female student skillfully tossed it to each of the examinees. As they inspected their soul-bound relics for quality and any potential defects, Ao approached the young female student, halting by her side. Senior, it appears my relic is of standard grade, whereas the others received common grade relics. This hardly seems fair to everyone, Ao expressed her concern, her gaze shifting towards the boxes held by her fellow examinees. Gazing back at Ao with a mischievous grin, the female student responded, Aham Tilda, perceptive as always. You possess an uncanny ability to discern the quality of these pearls even while they remain concealed within their boxes and most of all, honest. However, it was mere happenstance that one standard grade soul-bound relic found its way to you amidst the random distribution. I see. Senior, please extend my deepest gratitude to Principal Lady Sophia. I am also thankful to you for your assistance. Might I inquire as to your name? Ao expressed her gratitude towards Sophia and the Dragon's Nest Training School, which had provided her with a sense of familial warmth amidst this foreign and lonely society. With a dismissive wave of her hand, the female student replied, My name holds little significance. Miss Ao, the principal has instructed me to deliver a message unto you. While acknowledging your exceptional strength, she warns you not to underestimate the goblins under any circumstances. Return promptly once you have gathered sufficient psyches. Do not venture too deep into the mountains and exercise utmost caution especially the church and its priests, the student cautioned, elegantly brushing a strand of her bangs aside as she spoke. 1.